Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another session of the CSBC interview series. And we are pleased to have with us today, Dr. Alan Bernstein, President and CEO of CIFAR, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, a Canadian-based global organization that builds global communities of the world's top researchers, addressing science and humanity's most important questions. Dr. Bernstein is a PhD of uh, PhD graduate of University of Toronto from famous James Till Lab, the champion of stem cell research. In 1974, he joined the Ontario Cancer Institute and became director of research in 94. His laboratory made significant discoveries on the molecular and cellular basis of cancer and discovered genes controlling stem cells of the blood forming system. A founding president of the Canadian Institute of Health Research, CIHR, he led the transformation of health research in Canada, creating Canada's first health research institutes. In 2010, Dr. Brainston became executive director of the Global HIV Vaccine Enterprise in New York, where he led an international alliance of organizations funding HIV vaccine research. He chairs and serves on numerous advisory and review boards around the world, including Bill and Melinda, Melinda Gates Foundation and the Sabine Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group, working to overcome the risks posed by vaccine hesitancy. Author of 260 peer-reviewed publications and over 65 pieces in, lay, in the lay press, he received numerous awards and eight honorary degrees, including McLaughlin Medal for the Royal Society of Canada, the Award of Excellence from Genetics Society of Canada, the Gardner Foundation uh, Whiteman Award, the Henry Friesen International Prize in Health Research, and the appointment to the Orders of Ontario and Canada. Welcome, Dr. Brinson, and thank you for accepting our invitation. And by the way, that was a pretty impressive CV. It was a long one. I don't know. It was impressive. Right? I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Excellent. Okay. So uh, uh, the format of the interview today is that I'll ask a few questions uh, for about 25 minutes or so, and then Q&A will be open for participants to write questions. Uh, you all can see the questions and feel free to vote up a question if you like, and please do not use the chat line because that will be used only for technical issues if you have. Uh, we are currently 55 participants in the session, and now to our conversation. And now, in just a bit of pretext uh, for our chat today, Government of Canada made several funding announcements for research on COVID-19, including some for research staff. Uh, there are a number of vaccine development projects in place in Canada, and it seems that there is some degree of coordination, maybe a good degree of coordination among scientists and policymakers in response to COVID-19. And now let me ask you, in your opinion, what are the unique features of Canada's science and policy landscape that have shaped its response to COVID-19? Well, first of all, you know, Canada has a very rich um, scientific community. Uh, we're, we're a strong community. We've, we've always been international. It's our, our DNA, it's in our DNA. Um, and it covers a pretty broad waterfront. <clears throat> On the other hand, we're also a small country, um, and, and we're about four or five percent of the world's scientific literature. Uh, and we also cover five and a half time zones. So all, I think all of these challenges kind of come together in opportunities. Uh, but I have been impressed uh, very much so with the, the international collaborations that have been going on involving Canadian scientists and some not, of course, uh, but I think the global scientific community has responded in a magnificent way to the pandemic. Uh, you know, we've, been, we've been asking some of our 400 CIFAR fellows, have they been pivoting, sort of the word of the week, uh, towards COVID-19? And it's remarkable to me from the, some of our physicists to social scientists, biologists, uh, almost everybody has been pivoting in quite profound ways. So I think Canada has a lot to offer to the global effort to end this pandemic, uh, given the strengths of our community and given the support of the Canadian government for science and evidence. So you give an A plus for the science policy review of the pandemic and response to pandemic. Well, I rarely give A pluses uh, <laughs> to anybody. So I'm not sure I would give an A plus. On the other hand, um, 
uh, I don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback. I, I think our, our civil servants, including our chief science advisor, Dr. Niemers, um, um, I, it's hard to imagine the amount of pressure that they are under in real time to make quick decisions uh, involving a lot of money uh, to move forward. And so I think we really need to have a lot of admiration for what they're doing. Um, and I'm not just saying that to be politically correct. I really honestly feel that. Um, will they be making mistakes? Of course. Uh, and I would actually be worried if they're not making mistakes. Because if you don't make mistakes, it means you're being too cautious. Uh, and in a pandemic, you don't have that luxury. Uh, the virus is moving quickly. We know that. And the countries that have hesitated are the ones that are trying to catch up and get control over the virus. Um, and so um, our deputy ministers, our elected officials, um, uh, Dr. Niemers, they all have to be working in real time and making real time decisions. Okay, uh, there's a lot of misinformation and uncertainty swirling in this pandemic. How can policymakers get sound, trustworthy information? What is your advice to policymakers? Well, before I answer that question, you know, I, I would say there's two kinds of information we should, or three kinds, really, we should be thinking about. The first is accurate information. The second is misinformation. But the third is disinformation. And disinf by that, I mean disinformation are people who deliberately are confusing the public. Um, and there are surprising large numbers of individuals and websites and messaging going on for all kinds of reasons, political and otherwise, of disinformation. Um, I think we've been relatively lucky here in Canada, not that the web respects borders, but we've been relatively lucky that um, here in Canada that the information we are getting as a public is pretty accurate and pretty on, pretty on board. Um, the other thing I would say about misinformation is, and I think this is hard for the public to understand, uh, and I'll give the example of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, uh, something that Dr. Tam has been criticized for because she, in quotes, changed her mind. Uh, so there again, I think it's an it's a interesting thing. In science, of course, we take it as a given that when new evidence comes in, we change our mind. That's, that's what science's forte is, really, is that we depend on evidence and not on ideology and not just someone's word for it. Um, and so I think what Dr. Tam did, but unfortunately the public doesn't quite understand the process of science. What Dr. Tam did is with new evidence, she changed her mind. And we, we should want her to do that. The worst thing we could have from our chief public health officer would be to stick to a prior position because that was her prior position, regardless of the information. Uh, that would be a disaster for the country. So I think we've been fortunate in that regard. Uh, but we also need to educate Canadians about science. Science is not about uh, adopting a position out of ideological, for ideological reasons or any other reason, and refusing to change our mind. That's, that would also be a huge disaster. So um, I, I think, again, I think we've been pretty good in that regard. But uh, is there a lot of misinformation out there? Absolutely. Um, and I think it does speak to the importance of science uh, to inform uh, not just policy making, but also how our politicians communicate with the Canadian public. Right. And, and uh, on that note, uh, there are some debates about testing and uh, to what extent we should test uh, for COVID-19. Some researchers are calling for population-wide testing, even those without symptoms. What do you think about that? I would be really happy if we could test, certainly in the two provinces that are mostly uh, most affected, which is Ontario and Quebec, two, our two most populous provinces, that we would test those individuals who, for whatever reason, are most at risk. Um, and so testing uh, without tracing, without contact tracing, is, is kind of only half the battle. So we need to test individuals who we think are most at risk, and then identify all their contacts and test those individuals and put them in quarantine. Because remember, aside from really acute cases, our, our, our options for treatment are kind of limited at the moment. So we, we have ventilators and, and things like that. But basically, 
most people who are, who are infected, um, their major risk is actually infecting other people. Um, and so if we're going to end the pandemic, absent a drug or a vaccine, then I think the most effective thing we can do is to identify those people. So I am more in favor of focused tracing, focused testing and focused tracing. Uh, I just don't think we have enough capacity to test everybody in this country or everybody in Ontario and Quebec. And I don't see the point of it. Most of us are negative. Um, so I, my metaphor for all of this is this pandemic is like a fire. It's a house fire. Um, and so when you're a fireman going into a house fire and you've been contacted, the fire started in the kitchen, you go into the kitchen first. Uh, I think probably the next place you go is the room right above the kitchen. Um, and you don't go into rooms that are far away in a distant wing of the house. That's a waste of energy and effort by a limited fire department. Um, so I think we need to be focused. Long answer to your question. Right? That, that, no, that's good. Thank you. Uh, we need the elaboration. So uh, let me just challenge you on the tracing issue you mentioned, because we've seen a lot of discussions and debate over AI-enabled technologies, you know, contact tracing applications. So how do we weight the risk uh, to privacy and the responsible use of data uh, with potential social benefits, societal benefits? Yeah. So a couple of things. One is, of course, contact tracing uh, is critical to actually get a handle on this pandemic, uh, absent of vaccine, of course. Um, and we also need to use any aspect of technology that's available to us um, provided it doesn't violate fundamental principles of our society. I think it would be foolish not to. Um, and so in a discussion I was having with Dr. Niemers, we were discussing exactly this point, and she turned around and asked CIFAR to convene a group uh, to actually look at this issue, uh, which we did. I was chaired by, uh, by Anne McClellan, uh, vice chair of CIFAR and a former deputy prime minister of Canada, with a very distinguished group of Canadians uh, who uh, uh, came from all walks of life, from uh, epidemiologists, from AI, to uh, uh, privacy lawyers, uh, legal experts, people interested in regulation of new technologies like, like AI. Uh, and we had a very good discussion. And we also uh, invited very distinguished investigators and scholars from about seven other countries to hear from them what is going on in their country? So the countries top of my head were U.S., U.K., Denmark, Israel, uh, uh, South Korea, and a few other countries. And we issued a report, which I would encourage everybody to look at. Uh, I've, I've, I've brought the front cover of it here, actually, anticipating this discussion. And that's, uh, I believe, in your website, right? That's on our website. It's the, right. it's the CIFAR Technology and Ethics in a Pandemic report. Um, and that group... Uh, uh, really, uh, the first thing they did was really to discuss the broad issue and then before they dived in. And I think the broad issue really was, is it a balancing act between privacy, for example, and the need to get data, uh, or should it be framed somewhere else in another way? And I think the, the agreement was it really should be framed as how do we optimize the well-being of Canadians? And optimize the well-being of Canadians includes, on the one hand, let's say privacy was not an issue at all, finding out where all of us are at every second of the day, at every, at every for the last two weeks. On the other hand, that would be a major invasion of privacy. So how, how do we optimize both of those things? And also uh, end the pandemic. That's obviously uh, critical. Um, and so the, the group came up with um, a number of different principles, if you will, uh, uh, to, to go forward if we're going to use these contact tracing apps, including the ones that use artificial intelligence. They include uh, privacy, as you've already mentioned, but it's more than privacy. There's transparency and accountability, uh, equity and diversity. So these, these apps, of course, use uh, smartphones. And so those people who, will be, who are in a contact with an individual who is COVID-19 positive would then get a text message, you should get tested right away because you were near somebody who was COVID-19 positive. So it's in your interest as a negative to, be, to have that smartphone and to have it on and to be using that app. But not all of us have smartphones. Homeless people don't have smartphones by and large. 
for example. People without good Wi-Fi don't have Wi don't have smartphones. So there's issues of equity and diversity. There's issues of cooperation and mobility. Um, if we're ever going to restore the economy and move freely across this country, mobility is a big issue. So that that's also factors into on the plus side, if you will, of using these apps. Um, a necessity proportionality. So once the pandemic ends, we have to make sure that all this contact tracing and the use of these apps that follow our mobility also end. Uh, and so th that's another important principle. And then qu quality and security and efficacy. Uh, if this were a medical device, we would require that it be shown to be safe and effective. Uh, we, the group felt exactly the same way, that the, you, the developers of these apps be required to show that they are safe and effective, effective in the sense that they actually enhance contact tracing. Uh, and then there's a number of uh, implementation principles beneath that. So it's a very complete report. That report was submitted to Dr. Niemers a number of weeks ago. Um, and if the government or governments, because this is a provincial responsibility, decide to use these apps, I hope they will reference that report because I think it was superbly done by a superb group of individuals. And uh, so I want to pick up on the last statement about the government. Do you think the policy making by governments will change as a result of the pandemic? Should we adopt new mechanisms for a more robust inclusion of scientific evidence into policy making? Well, one of my, you know, dreams is that, in, in fact, science is important for this pandemic. That's clear. Uh, but it's important, it goes way beyond the pandemic. I, I have argued, for example, on climate change, that a little bit like a vaccine for the pandemic, the only way I can see out of climate change is science. Uh, and I would say the same thing about the pandemic. Science is our exit strategy. Uh, it's, it's our solution. Now, what I can be accused of being a little bit over-enthusiastic about science, but I really do believe that. Um, and so I hope that one of the important lessons, not just to our, our policymakers, but to Canadians, is how important science is uh, in dealing with this pandemic. And if you think about it, um, we, the focus immediately would be to vaccines and drug development, for example. But it actually goes way beyond that. Uh, if, if you think about physical distancing. So physical distancing is based on, first of all, the germ theory of disease, that there's actually something, if I'm COVID-19 positive, there's something I have that is infectious that could be can, transmitted to somebody who's close to me uh, that would actually cause the disease in that other person. It's not an imbalance in the humors in my body, which only goes back about 200 years. It goes back to Louis Pasteur. So the germ theory of, of disease is a beautiful piece of science from 150 years ago. Secondly, uh, washing our hands. Um, that's also based on the germ theory of disease. Uh, that's number two. Third, the diagnostics. The diagnostics are all based on everybody, all my friends who are not scientists know about PCR. Well, PCR was a Nobel Prize winning experiment about uh, 35 years ago. Uh, by Kerry Mullis. Uh, he actually shared it with Michael Smith, a great Canadian who worked on site-specific mutagenesis of DNA. So that's a beautiful piece of science for amplifying small bits of DNA. Uh, so that's great science. Um, and of course, drug development these days is a very sophisticated combination of knowing the structure of proteins and the design of small molecules using AI to, to facilitate De developing new drugs that would shape, change the shape of those proteins, and that's the drug. Uh, and ditto vaccines. Vaccine development these days is very sophisticated science. So right from uh, physical distancing to vaccine development and drug, drug development, it is all about science. Uh, and I don't see any other strategy for dealing with this pandemic. So do you think that the pandemic has changed anything in the relationship between science and society? Is there more trust in science? Is science in a, in a better position now compared to, let's say, uh, pre-COVID era? I'd like to think so. Uh, and and I, I certainly think that, uh, for example, in the United States, the contrast between the President of the United States and, what, and his remarks about the pandemic and Tony Fauci's remarks beside him 
um, I think have helped immeasurably to elevate the importance of science, not just in the United States, but actually worldwide. Uh, and so I think we all owe uh, Dr. Fauci a huge debt of gratitude for what he's been doing, uh, for really demonstrating in real life the importance of science and the style of science and the philosophy of science and the measured approach of science to dealing with things. We under promise and hopefully over deliver. And I think that's what scientists have been doing on everything for a long time. So it's interesting to me that things like serology and PCR have become part of everyone's lexicon. And I think that speaks to the pervasiveness now of science during this pandemic. So yes, I am hopeful that that has happened and will continue to be front of mind for the Canadian public. So before opening uh, up the questions to the participants, uh, I want to ask you this because you mentioned some of the uh, advancement in scientific research in the past um, uh, three, four decades. Uh, I want to ask you this, after HIV pandemic, uh, we witnessed significant advancement in molecular biology. Uh, do you, how do you see COVID-19 affecting scientific research moving forward? What advancements do you think uh, we will see after COVID-19? Will scientific research be transport, transformed to a new era uh, of, you know, in, in terms of particular research area or, or multidisciplinary area? What do you think? Great question, first of all. Um, well, I think one of the things that's evident already is the extent of global collaboration amongst the scientific community. Uh, that happened really literally overnight when scientists from around the world started collaborating on vaccine development, for example, including Canadian scientists uh, and including on, on, and also on drug development. So I think that's been a kind of uh, our modus operandi and it's come to the fore even more so now. I think that's also true in terms of interdisciplinarity. I think the bringing to bear every possible discipline onto this problem uh, has been striking. I think the third thing is, you know, we, we have faced, and lots of people have talked about this in the scientific community, a kind of migration away from science by young people. They have not seen the, the raison d'etre of science uh, in terms of their lives and the importance of science and, and, and how they look at the world. I'm hoping that really bright young people will now understand how important science is for society and for the world, and will therefore be attracted to pursuing a career in science. Um, and, and of course, science depends 100% on bright young people. It, they are the future, and bright young people have really transformed science forever including, as you mentioned, post-HIV and pre-HIV, actually. Uh, and so I'm hoping we will attract a great generation of young people who really get it, that science is the, is the lock that will open so many doors to understanding the world around us and benefiting humanity. And I, I can't imagine a, a better way present, to spend one's life than to use your brain to understand the world around you and benefit humanity. It's who could ask for a better job? Um, excellent. And, and the last part of that question, about the way that we do science, anything will change. For example, open data. What do you think? I, I think, well, it's a really good point. I think the, um, the scientific community, really led by people here in Canada, by, I'm thinking of Alan Edwards, uh, for example, who heads up the Structural Genomics Consortium, uh, and uh, people like Yui Lo, who heads up the Montreal Neurological Institute, have both been really international champions of open science um, and of sharing data and of sharing really everything. And again, I think in the time of a pandemic, it's hard to justify keeping data secret. And so that philosophy and that approach to science, one can only hope that that will permeate our culture more uh, and not evaporate once the pandemic ends. Uh, and so I'm not a good predictor of the future. I won't pretend to be, but certainly that is happening now um, in, to the extent even including the pharmaceutical industry that they have been very open, as far as I know, with, with sharing data and with working with academics to move forward as quickly as possible. So we can only hope that that will continue afterwards. 
Thank you. Now let's go to questions from participants. I'm going to ask you, please use the question and answer box in the bottom of your screen, not the chat line. Only chat line we use only for technical issues. And feel free to vote up a question if you like. Meantime, my colleagues at CSBC office will share a survey about uh, just one question asking which sector you belong to. This uh, helps us to for uh, better planning for future sessions. And I ap appreciate if you could uh, just click the, ser uh, the, the sector that you're coming from, being nonprofit, private government, academia, media, and others. And thank you in advance for that. And I will also open up the questions. Um, Okay, so we got the first question, Alan, is uh, my question is about science funding policies. What are Dr. Greenstein's thoughts on the effect of the pandemic on the future uh, of uh, researchers who are not working on COVID-19 related research? Does the 450 million federal support to universities and research institutes go far enough to mitigate the issues related to research? shutdown delay due to pandemic? Will there be payments losses in the research community because of this? Yeah, great question. Um, I can't comment whether 450 is enough or not. I just don't, don't know enough. Uh, secondly, in terms of um, uh, inability to access one's lab because of the pandemic, of course, that's, that's affecting all of us. I don't think it's a science policy issue. I think it's a pandemic physical distancing issue. Um, but I do think that one of the things the pandemic has demonstrated is the importance of all areas of research is going to become relevant to, in this case, a pandemic. Um, and I think it's the opportunity of a lifetime for the scientific community to make that case to policymakers and elected officials. So I already gave the example of PCR. Kerry Mullis, did, Kerry Mullis did not invent PCR to deal with COVID-19. Uh, and so all of a sudden that's key to diagnostics. And ditto actually the serology uh, was based on the, the ELISA test for detecting antibodies, was not there to design, was not designed uh, for COVID-19. So these are perfect illustrations, perfect stories to tell our elected officials and policymakers about the relevance of all areas of science to everything, including this pandemic. And you never know, of course, you never know what area of science is going to become relevant. So to me, COVID to the Canadian scientific community to make the case to support fundamental research across the waterfront. Uh, the other example I would give is AI. AI has become key to drug development and vaccine development. It was not developed. I know that because it started at CIFAR. It, AI was not developed for any of those purposes. Um, and so again, it's a great example of a story that we should be telling everybody that, within earshot of the importance of all areas of science, and you never know when they're going to become important. Okay, so there is a question by Karen Dodd. Um, she's saying, what do you see as some of the key science challenges in working towards a safe, effective vaccine? Please comment on the science itself, how the science is done and how the science is communicated, shared with decision makers and the public. First of all, hi, Karen. I haven't seen you for a long time. I hope you're, hope you're well. Um, well, the science of vaccine development, that's a, an hour lecture. Um, look, there's three or four different ways of developing vaccines, which we all have heard about. Uh, there's using RNA molecules, which is a whole new modality, yet to be successful, but fingers crossed. Uh, using vac viral vectors as vectors to deliver the immunogen to our bodies. Uh, there's uh, DNA molecules, naked DNA molecules is another approach. And then, of course, the old-fashioned approach, tied, tried and true, for going back to polio, is uh, inactivated viruses uh, and also virus-like particles, another example. So the four or five vaccine platforms um, for making these vaccines. That part of it actually is uh, the actual early, early stages of it are fairly straightforward. Um, there are now about 100 uh, vaccine designs going on worldwide. 
one of my concerns is most of them that I'm aware of at least are focused on the spike protein. You know, we've all seen pictures of the coronavirus and it's got these crowns, hence the name coronavirus, on the outside. These are the spike proteins. Most people, not unreasonably, are, are betting that that, uh, that molecule is a good target for making a vaccine. That's true, but we need some diversity of approaches if that one doesn't work. Um, so there are proteases uh, in the virus, for example. There's other molecules, replicases, that, that could be targets for vaccine development. Having said that, uh, the next step, of course, would be to test it in an animal model. So apparently ferrets are a good animal model for coronaviruses, and I know that's being done in certain, certain labs. But we, you'll never have, uh, we, for no virus, do we have a perfect animal model. Uh, humans, ultimately, are the perfect animal model for a human vaccine. Um, and so at some point, we have to do a phase one trial. A phase one trial involves just testing safety, not efficacy, but just safety. And for example, the Moderna trial, the Moderna vaccine, the RNA molecule has already gone into a phase one trial. Uh, the Chinese, the CanSino group in China, now in partnership with the National Research Council here in Canada, um, have done, and we actually were the first to report in Cell a few days ago, the first results of a phase one trial looking at both safety and antibody production, people who were vaccinated with, with an adenovirus-based vaccine. Uh, then you get to phase two, which is larger than a phase three, where you start looking for efficacy. Um, and so the, both the cost and the complexity actually goes up as the vaccine goes along the pipeline to a phase three, and then ultimately manufacturing and dissemination. So there, there are a lot of steps between a great scientific idea and actually putting a vaccine in a vial and giving it in someone's arm. Um, uh, and so the, we, not, we need to stop focusing just on the science. I mean, that's my tendency, I'm a scientist, but we also need to start focusing on the whole pipeline. And a lot of vaccines don't fail over here. They fail somewhere along this clinical trials pipeline. They're either not safe or they're not efficacious. And HIV is a great example of that, unfortunately. Yeah, all right. Um, so there's a question by David Rose, I think. Hi, David, uh, from University of Waterloo. Uh, great to see two medical biophysics alumni leading the discussions. He refers to you and me, I guess. <laughs> I have a question with two parts, uh, partly contradictory. We have had many pan pandemics before, and we have seen how short memories can be in science funding policy and social attention. If we had continued coronavirus research after SARS, Merx, uh, and uh, we would have been in a lot better shape now. On the other hand, uh, there are many other important health issues uh, of high importance. How do we define and, and maintain this balance uh, in an environment of limited research funding? I, I think that's a great question. It, it is a great question. Um, and when, certainly when I was president of CIHR, it's one that uh, kept me awake at night um, because, you, uh, you know, just to take health research for, for, for a moment, it's a hugely wide spectrum of research. Uh, it ranges everything from uh, building up capacity in our health systems, uh, how to, what's the best way of running an emergency ward, that's part of CIHR's business, uh, to molecular biology of viruses um, and of cancer and you, you know, name your favorite disease. So these are, these are uh, tough issues for any funder to deal with. Recognizing, of course, that resources will always be finite and there will never be enough resources to fund everything. Um, and so I think the only solution is both to argue for more money, which I certainly spent a lot of my time doing, still do, uh, but the other is, so, is, to, is to make sure that you fund the very best people Across, across a very broad waterfront. Um, and again, it's been imp impressive to me to watch how the Canadian scientific community and indeed the world scientific community has been pivoting from whatever they were doing before to working on COVID-19. And so it does speak to the, 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 first of all, the interest of the scientific community to help society and to deal with this but also the translatability of the technologies that we have from one area to another. 
Um, uh, and I think that that speaks to the power of science. And again, these are the messages we need to be delivering to our policymakers, just how powerful science has become and, and therefore how worthy it is of being supported, whatever one is interested in. Uh, but yeah, I think the, to go back to the original question, um, it is a tough, it is a tough uh, thing to do. I think the worst thing you can do is to give everybody a little bit of money and fool yourself that now you're funding everything across the waterfront, and that's great. We're now dealing with everything because you're giving everybody just enough money, in my judgment, to not to, not to be internationally competitive. And unless we're internationally competitive, we're not at the forefront of science, and science is about being at the forefront. So I, I believe very strongly in funding excellence at the highest possible level. Uh, so let me pick on that, uh, uh, if I may, uh, that's the participant's time, but uh, uh, we have a number of vaccines projects uh, under development. So what do you think about that? Should we have one or two or we have multiple? Well, it's interesting, you know, to see what, what the Brits have done, what, what's going on in the UK with vaccine development. So there have been, um, I'm sure, a number of, of proposals around vaccine development. And of course, you, you don't know which one is ultimately going to become a vaccine. And so you have to make some pretty knowledgeable gambles as to which ones you think are the, hold the best promise. Um, but you can't gamble on all of them at, to the same extent. You just don't have the resources. Um, and so the British are, are funding about 10 or 12 at the early scientific level to the far left of that pipeline that I just talked about. But in terms of the ones that they are hoping to push through into clinical trials, where it really gets expensive and the machinery to do it becomes very complex, they're betting on only two. Uh, uh, the one in Oxford based on a chimpanzee uh, adenovirus vector and the one at Imperial College uh, run by Robin Shattuck, uh, the one in Oxford by Sarah Gilbert. So they're, they're putting a lot of money, hundreds of millions of pounds on just two vaccines. And they already, already are starting to build vaccine manufacturing facilities based on the assumption that one of those two will work. Um, so, um, so I think there, there, you, can, you can bet on some early on, but you gotta make some decisions big time uh, in terms of real financial resources on, on less than a handful. Thank you for that. So uh, there is a question, what are the unique features of Canada's research and policy landscape that distinguish our response from that of other countries? Well, I think, as I said, I think to your very first question, Meredith, I think we have been very lucky here in Canada because our political leaders right from the prime minister on down have understood the importance of science and evidence and to guiding policies throughout this pandemic. And just think about what's going on in the United States or the United Kingdom over the last three or four months. So I think we should really uh, be very thankful that we, we, we have a leadership that understands evidence and the importance of science. And so we're dealing with a, a fertilized field that we should nurture. Uh, and we have lots of great stories to tell and we should tell those stories right up the food chain, up to the prime minister. And we have a chief science advisor who has been very much involved with what's going on in Ottawa and understands, of course, the importance of science and the, the culture of science, which is also very important. Okay, and before the last question, my colleagues at CSBC, uh, or maybe before the two questions, uh, the share a survey about our performance, please, uh, just this is one question, we appreciate your response to that. And uh, meantime, I can ask the question, uh, do you have uh, insights uh, into the criteria the UK used to support their decision to fund uh, two vaccine candidates? I don't know if you uh, Yeah, uh, I have some insight into it. Okay. Um, uh, I, I think there was two broad criteria, and I'm not speaking for them, I just my, my interpretation of what's happened. Uh, the first is, the first insight was, I think they chose two very different platforms. One was a chimpanzee adenovirus vector to deliver the spike gene into, into humans as an immunogen, possible vaccine. And the second was an RNA modality based vaccine. So two very different approaches, um, as opposed to two very similar ones, but then why have two different ones? So, and I think the second criteria was the excellence 
of the investigators involved, Sarah Gilbert and Robin Chaddock, outstanding investigators. Okay, and the last question now, and I ask this because it's a, a sort of different nature uh, by Anne Richard. Uh, increasingly, there have been reports of increased espionage of COVID-related research and Canadian security agencies have uh, released alerts of increased cyber threats within the Canadian health research ecosystem. How can Canadian researchers balance international collaboration and open science while mitigating risk related to cyber espionage? Well, I think our first responsibility is to develop um, drugs and vaccines and anything else that we can think of as quickly as possible. I think that's, that's our number one responsibility. Um, and I would worry less about uh, those other issues. Um, I, I think it's too much to ask a scientist collaborating with many individuals uh, across the world to start worrying about espionage and things. It's not our area of expertise. Our area of expertise is to do science. Um, and to get on with it and to end this pandemic as quickly as possible. And I hate to end the, uh, the session without asking the question that was uh, post here, posted here, which is AI related. That's, I think, should okay. be asked. Uh, it's in the uh, similar arena. But while it is impossible to see the future, could you please comment on how science policies uh, and funding should be designed such that they will promote the development of the technologies, new technologies, such as platform disruptive technologies like AI? if there is any additional comment on that. So I'm not quite sure I understand the question, Meredith. You'll have to- Yeah, let me just repeat it because I uh, cut the background of the question. So thank you very much for the presentation. You described the importance of science in developing technologies that may have benefits uh, beyond what they were originally designed and mentioned that financial resources will always be limited. While it is impossible to see the future, could you comment uh, on how science policies and funding should be designed such that they will promote development of these technologies, such as platform disruptive technologies like AI? I think the short answer is bet on people. Put your money on really great, smart people, uh, and you can't go wrong. Okay, that is very good. Uh, thank you all. And that brings us to the end of the conversation. And uh, let me just remind people that uh, our next session will be an interview with Dr. Gord McCauley, President and CEO of Admir Bio Innovations on securing domestic knowledge for Canada's future, which will be held on Thursday, June 4th at noon. Uh, note that the panel submission deadline for science policy conference is June 12th. And if you wish to suggest ideas to us regarding these virtual sessions, please use the survey monkey question right after this session and add your ideas. I want to thank Alan for being with us uh, today. It was a pleasure for me. And the final word goes to you. Well, I've enjoyed our conversation. I think these are the stakes are high. I don't think there's ever been a global crisis that's affected so many people, perhaps other than climate change, but certainly not at the speed that, that this pandemic is, is affecting the world. Um, and I think there's never been a global crisis that has been so dependent on our brains and on science for it to, to solve it. And I'm very encouraged by the, um, the way that the scientific community in this country and in the world are, have been working together in such an amazingly collaborative way to help policymakers and to help the, the world deal with this pandemic. I think it's quite impressive. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, for last word and uh, wish you a very pleasant afternoon. And thanks everyone for your participation and see you next week. Thank you.